it's really my pleasure to, to be here uh, today and really talk about a, a topic that's really close to my heart. And Rona, thank you so much for those kind words. It's uh, actually quite phenomenal for somebody like me that was studying in plant gen genetics and turned to the evil social sciences afterwards to see that now there's really a renaissance of social science and a realization among a lot of disciplines, scientific disciplines, that indeed is extremely important nowadays to pay attention to what the social sciences have to tell us in order to make sure we take into account public opinion and public attitude whenever we communicate about complicated scientific topics. And this really explains why in the last decade or so, there's been an increasing uh, attention paid to what we call the science of science communication, which is basically applying scientific techniques to uh, the, the idea of communication in the context of scientific disciplines. Uh, science communication, broadly construed, means understanding the interface between science policy and any type of communication process. In my case, I'm interested in online environments, so I focus more particularly on Twitter, uh, websites, blogs, and so on, but other, some of my colleagues have uh, uh, looked at other type of interfaces. How are is science represented in those uh, uh, interfaces, and how is actually the public using the information that's online to understand science and potentially construct what we call scientific controversies? In a nutshell, why are people fighting about all that stuff? And why, what can we do, what do we know? that will help the actors that are engaged in actually producing that science do it in a way, communicate in a way that would not only promote good public engagement, because obviously nobody wants to silence anybody, but also make sure that it's not misinformation or potentially vocal voices that do not represent the majority that actually gain the stage and end up being the most powerful. So combine this with a lot of insight actually from social psychology in the context of risk, and I know a lot of you are interested in risk assessment and a lot of your disciplines have something to do with uh, this concept of risk. Uh, risk uh, psychology of risk has been actually a topic of inquiry for a long time now, since the 80s. It started basically with nuclear uh, engineering, and now it's really been, uh, uh, you know, transposed to a lot of different uh, disciplines. And in this case, uh, you know, this has been ap applicable to a lot of different topics that my lab has looked at over the years, such as global climate change, or you see, food safety, biotechnology, which is my initial training as applied to plants, Nanotechnology, my more recent work with the uh, uh, Nanoscale Science Engineering Center, synthetic biology more recently, stem cell research and alternative energy, just to let you, uh, you know, give you a little bit of the flavor of the type of topics that are of interest uh, in uh, uh, my group. So what I will talk about today is really try to convince you of something that I know you're already convinced about. Why do we need an informed uh, scientific uh, citizenry. Why do we need to think about giving information to citizens about these topics and why is it important to do so as fast as we can to some extent while taking into account what people like me and others uh, in the same disciplines uh, uh, bring you as far as research uh, funding. This put into the context of the evolving science communication environment. A lot of things have changed, obviously, over the last decade or so, that has completely changed how we think of communication or how we think about science produced somewhere getting, at the end of the day, in the hands of lay individuals. So what has changed and why is it important to think about? And who are those people that potentially are interested in this information and where do they find it? I will talk about the specificity of the online context. Why do we need to continue this kind of research? Why do we need your help? Why do we need actually institutions to, uh, to make sure that this research takes place? And I will conclude by a specific case study of recent research we've done in this context that we call actually the nasty effect. So the nature of scientific problems are changing. And obviously a lot of you in this room uh, are aware of the fact that right now it, with really a lot of new development, it's hard to say, oh, this is just food science. This is just chemistry. This is just physics. This is just genetics. 
As a matter of fact, most of the high-tech things and the things that are produced nowadays in the labs combine the expertise of a lot of different people, of a lot of different disciplines, and therefore are producing uh, things that are going fast, that are developing really quickly and potentially will be deployed in society at a pace that goes extremely fast without society having time to react to this kind of thing. And I think nanotechnology is a good example. We have uh, uh, close to 2,000 products in the marketplace that are based in some kind of nanomaterial. However, as far as nanotoxicity and the potential impacts on the environment or human health, let's say the research is not going as fast as potentially the market development. Is that good, is that bad? That's not the case. However, at what point those issues stop being scientific only scientific and become some kind of social issue for which discourses related to regulations, to ethics, to legal, to social implication have to take place, for which different groups will have a say, will have different opinions, and therefore extremely important for all the scientists that are involved in the production of this kind of uh, uh, products or technology to be aware of this and make sure they participate in the dialogue. Uh, the concerns that are emerging for this kind of issue actually go much faster than different institutions being able to put in place the mechanism that would make sure that everybody that would need to have a voice can do it. Therefore, what ends up happening is the citizen or ease users or whatever you want to call it, taxpayers, uh, end up actually just having at their disposal the information that's produced most of the time in the scientific environment. Because what ha in the scientific environment that's not in the lab, but the e is actually in online platforms, for example. And we need to remember that most of the scientific debates happen in what we call the political arena. What do I mean by that? That means that if you think in terms of the life of somebody, here, you know, like we, let's say somebody that would uh, uh, be, how do I, I cannot make this work. I think I have to use the other one. You, can you see this? If you imagine seeing what I'm pointing, <laughs> see when you're communicating, you have to find a way to say whatever you want to say. So. Just look at the graph, basically, and you'll see that actually this is supposed to represent the lifespan of an individual, at least, you know, uh, as far as uh, potentially engaging in deliberation in the public realm. So 70 and so, uh, and, and later, and then you can see the number of, uh, of uh, potentially years of this person's life that would actually allow them, her or him, to get information about science. If you see the actual number of years that are devoted to education, this is from K to 12, uh, uh, you know, in pink and in blue, the college uh, years, you can see that actually the formal time for which people are, are actually trained to think in terms of science, it's extremely small. In the big realm of things, the rest of the time, the empty space, that white sphere is actually populated by information that comes from media environment. This is it. This is where people learn this stuff. That means that we need to give them something that they will actually be able to use to make informed decisions. It is uh, a society, like actually, uh, you know, an association such as yours here, I think has an extremely important role to play in this kind of, uh, of realm, because indeed what's produced in this kind of conference, for example, is of extremely potential interest to a lot of different parties. So I don't know if you have an hashtag with a Twitter account uh, related to the conference, but it's likely that somebody that's interested, let's say, to my talk, uh, would actually connect to see, you know, what I'm talking about. And if somebody's tweeting, therefore, potentially, you have the close to 20% of the adult American population right now that's now on Twitter that would be able to see what I have to say. As a matter of fact, interestingly enough, I was at the National Academy of Science uh, Friday and Thursday on a workshop on genetic engineering, basically talking about the same idea, the importance of social science in actually helping 
us understand uh, you know, different debates related to this technology. And we realized that a lot of people were following uh, our presentations on Twitter. So we shouldn't think that this is really something that doesn't matter to people. If they want to listen, they will. However, we need to make sure that actually we are there making sure they can listen if they want. So why am I talking about Twitter? Why am I talking about uh, people that may want to listen? Well, the science communication environment has really changed. It used to be that we could, or we had, science communication officers or science journalists that would be in contact with institutions and would report on research or things that are interesting to people and actually talk about it, right? Well, most science columns have disappeared to most of the major newspapers. So unfortunately, science writing is actually done by freelancers. I don't know, I don't say they're not good. Actually, my department trained them. They're not sure that their actually uh, work is gonna be published, whatever they intend to publish. So basically what happened right now is that the traditional views of science communication have been completely redefined. As a matter of fact, if I ask you, where do you go when you want to find information about something? What's the first thing you will do? You're gonna Google it. So Google would be the first step for people to find out about science. People may actually, after Googling a certain keyword, end up on a blog. And these blogs, sometimes, these science blogs were like one of the major, uh, 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 you know, group of bloggers that were interested in science and technology. Uh, these bloggers actually are chosen based on their interest and excitement about science, not always based on their training about science. Um, people may actually end up on YouTube. As a matter of fact, 80%, more than 80% of uh, the American adult population goes to YouTube to find out about different topics. And as a matter of fact, this uh, uh, video that you see here that's been watched more than five million times is actually extremely good video that was put together by a science teacher uh, to actually talk about the risk assessment in the context of climate change. He had to, uh, to put it down. Uh, uh, because there were so many comments in his video. So again, filling the void that was left by uh, science columns disappearing from traditional newspaper. Another example of YouTube here, that's something that pleased my engineering colleagues, it's uh, uh, some uh, videos that are produced by scientists themselves end up generating a lot of views. As a joke that I tell again to my engineering friends in the engineering school at UW-Madison, who would have thought that the video produced by engineers will generate six million views. Just so you know, there's a stereotypical view of engineers that being able to communicate. Things have changed. So everybody right now potentially has the power to reach a lot of people. A little video with the very few means generating six million views, talking about nano quadrotors. Seriously, this is something that would have been unimaginable a few years ago. Another thing that has changed, and it goes back to actually your view of Twitter here, Rona, is that direct communication is, as I was telling you with the engineering, very often embraced directly by uh, younger scientists. And what we have seen in the last two years, I would say, at least based on our research, that really the younger generation, mainly among PhD and postdoc, are very present on Twitter. And we have seen them actually more present for controversial scientific topics, such as, uh, I would say, a lot on ecology, uh, a lot on, on uh, uh, you know, natural sciences, life sciences, really uh, present, I would say. And with the idea that now when we talked about science blogging, without uh, talking about scientists blogging, or scientists writing, at least the younger generation, we are missing the point, and this quote is not from me, actually. It was an editorial that was written in Nature Chemistry in 2011, three years ago, that was actually arguing that the role of scientists now has changed. From being only researchers, that would be like the, the hat on the right that we have here since I cannot point, for being also bloggers, journalists, editors, they are choosing what they're blogging, they're tweeting, etc. potentially, not knowing exactly what they're doing. 
So I think on the one hand, it's very good. On the other hand, it can be very dangerous if they don't know how to do it very well. And therefore, a really um, increasing willingness from different institutions to put actually training together to actually help those young uh, scientists communicate about their sciences in a meaningful way. I will be uh, speaking at the uh, uh, American Association for the Advancement on Science uh, in February. Different workshops are taking place on tweeting, blogging, etc., to give hands-on experience to those young scientists. So very, very important to think that right now, scientists are embracing communication. If they have the means to do so, if their organization let them do so, and if the director of the labs let them do so. Because sometimes you still have the stereotypical view that this is not good for science. This is take time away from real science. Well, I want to dispel this myth here today. We actually are potentially, I think in a month or so, publishing an article that showed that the more people were tweeting about their research, the more than academic standing as far as citation. There was actually a controlling, it's actually a predictive model for controlling a number of things. I can go on more in doing the question and answer. The more people were tweeting about their research and the more they talked to the reporter, the more an interactive effect that would actually increase the potential for them to be cited. Therefore, it's good for science. It's not good only for public engagement. It's good for the scientists themselves. So traditional media have been replaced by online social media. And that basically, as I was telling you, you know, the science columns of different traditional newspapers are disappearing. Facebook knows this, and that it knows that a lot of uh, uh, journalists now are working as freelancers. That's why they put together a page, as you see on the left here, that, uh, that's just giving the journalists or the potential science writers, bloggers, uh, you know, that want to actually uh, be, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, efficient in what they do, a platform to help them do so. On the right, you see actually some uh, data that's uh, for, from two or three years ago that compares the daily circulation of our major newspaper here in the United States, apologies for the international people in the room, uh, uh, that uh, their circulation to the potential risk of reach of Facebook. So if you look at the daily active users in US of uh, uh, in thousand here, of the, uh, the major newspaper, you see that we are here at 8 million roughly versus 126 million for Facebook. So if you had to put your eggs somewhere as fast communicating, better doing a social network than actually do it through a traditional newspaper. And this kind of thing has been recognized by the most, let's say, traditional institution in the journalism world, the Pulitzer, that has given in 2013 the Pulitzer Prize for reporting to actually a small alternative blog. Seven people, a little blog that actually is funded by fundraising, it's not even for profit, they, they, they are got the Pulitzer Prize for reporting, which shows you, I think, very clearly that things have changed. Things have changed as far as who has the power to potentially persuade, inform, entertain in a meaningful way the millions of citizens that are interested in your science, in my science, in risk, in things that are important in daily life. And this also has to be paired with the fact that this science can go viral. And I'm sure that you all know what it means to go viral in uh, the, the online environment. It means basically, and uh, apologies, you cannot see that very well, that this basically means that one little piece of information can go from one network to the other. Well, if you think of the New York Times, and somebody reading the New York Times, most likely everybody that reads the New York Times is comparable to another reader of the New York Times. Educated, college educated, person that's interested in the vast uh, areas of different disciplines. So that's what we call in communication an echo chamber, talking to each other, talking to people that are like you, that have the like-minded, and that will most likely have broadly construed the same opinion and attitudes about certain issues that say related to food safety. Well, in the online environment, this actually can change. 
If you look at the middle of this little uh, uh, graph here, and this is based on research from Watson Dodds at MIT actually looking at network analysis, the same piece of information, if you actually are in a group that happens to have an individual that's connected to another group, which is connected to another group by only one individual, that information can make a lot of distance, potentially reaching people that don't think the same way, potentially really opening you know, the discussion to people that are not like-minded. And that's what we want when we talk about science communication. So it sounds great, right? Potentially, we can look for anything from anywhere with a lot of little social networks that connect people around things that are interesting to them social networks, right? However, it may also not be as great as it is, as I was telling you, if we don't know exactly uh, what's going on. So I will talk about uh, the science information consumer and then explain to you why it may not be uh, as great as uh, uh, we think it is. The poor people formerly known as the audience is a term that was coined by uh, Jay Rosen, a professor in uh, 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 New York that actually argue that what makes the beauty of this new information is like anybody, you, me, you actually on Twitter, right? We are producers, editors, writers. We produce the information. We react to you. There's not anymore a information and another. Now, we all actually, the producers, the writers, the journalists, the bloggers, right? Well, and these audiences that are not the audiences anymore, they are online for science. Recent data, and this is data from the, the uh, National Science Foundation, it came out in what we call the National Science Engineering Indicators in 2014. This is based on data in 2012. Shows you that when people look for information, follow broadly construed science and technology related information, they go online. Here is, in black, uh, people going and being on the internet to follow things about science and technology, food safety, nutrition, nanotechnology, and so on. As a matter of fact, we have, uh, you know, this data specifically for nanotechnology, if you're interested. Not on newspapers online, not on specific magazine online, but online-only sources, Google, blogs, such as the little blog that I was telling you about, and therefore extremely important to have that information there for people to find it. The science information consumer is where we don't expect him or her to be. Not looking at newspaper, magazine, and such, but actually looking at a, a specific online uh, 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 information. And keeping in mind that the audiences apply shortcut for uh, processing information about science, this means that we need to have a conscious effort, all of us, to counter whatever misinformation may be out there. What do I mean by shortcuts? It means that there's a myth here that's been dispelled by at least a decade of social science research that shows that actually knowledge, just the understanding, just the understanding, amount only for small amount of variance when you want to explain attitudes of uh, a group of people towards something. Let's say, how do people feel about nanomaterials? Well, if you explain what the technology comes about, that can explain a little bit of why they would support it or not, but most of the rest of this explanation relies on their values, political ideology, the deference to scientific authority, their religious beliefs, their previous you know, understanding of the issues, uh, the, the, the different media messages and framing they see, and so on. So that's where those heuristic and mental shortcuts play an important role, and that's why I was telling you it looks great, but, and I will tell you a little bit more about the specific inline environment uh, as, uh, as we're closing uh, this talk. What does it make it so different? Why is it different? Why do we care? Why should we be careful? And why do I want all of you, although I hope, you will all go on Twitter and follow us, right? But also, be careful about what it means as far as potentially damaging public attitudes or potentially being, you know, dangerous for the scientific discourse. 
Well, what happened in the online environment is, first of all, as I was telling you, people start by uh, searching, right? What, what we have sh shown in different studies, and one uh, more particularly in the context of nanotechnology, is if you look at what people search for, let's say they search nanotechnology and the environment, and we can track where they search for with Nielsen data, specific data source, and we look at what they find based on intelligent algorithm and you know, gathering all the content that you can find with those different data, there is a discrepancy. As a matter of fact, what we found is that even if you plug nanotechnology and the environment, the most likely information that people will find is related to the medical field. Well, it just happened that this is the information that's more easily accessible with the algorithm of Google, Google's that make people find it. You can see here on this screen that I showed you the keyword and then I showed you a number of uh, uh, things that are proposed to people to click on, right? Well, it's a little bit of a, an interesting catch-22 here because when we look for something on Google, this will actually increase the number of searches for this, which will increase the traffic, which will increase the likelihood of that page to come up a certain way in your search, which will increase the likelihood of the Google suggestion to say that thing. So even if I am interested in a specific topic, based on what peop other people have searched, something else will come up. And this has been actually uh, shown by people like me as being extremely dangerous, extremely problematic, and mainly due to all of us not be present enough on this environment. Because it just happens that opinion may be formed much more how, how Google present the results than individuals actually searching specifically things. And again, this may be, obviously it's not a big scheme of Google going afterwards, they, they, after the science consumer, they're trying to be the most uh, helpful for people to have uh, uh, the opportunity to find what they, they mean, but it does raise an issue when we want to make sure that a lot of information is uh, available. Uh, at the same time as we publish our paper, actually there's a, a, a book that came uh, by Eli uh, Pariser that called the filter bubble that pointed to the same ideas. So Google searching algorithms means that we need to be very careful and I think Coca-Cola is really good actually as a, an understanding this kind of, of environment and there's a discrepancy in the different type of institution, different type of context, the size of the business, how much uh, they can, uh, you know, invest in communication will actually make a difference. My take home message, as you can uh, imagine, is that it is worth investing in communication, particularly when we talk about uh, science and different controversial topics. The second thing that's important information uh, in uh, the online environment is the fact that that information is contextualized. That makes it very different from what we used to have. We used to go, let's say, to Starbucks, get Wall Street Journal, New York Times, read in a little corner, and then we're fine with it. Well, the information environment is like somebody in Starbucks was screaming to you, hey, look at this, this is great. Go to page eight, <laughs> right? And this is what we have in the online environment. When you see the most emailed articles, the most, uh, you know, favored by people, like constantly remind you of what's important to others and giving us some kind of priming of how we should feel about that information. So basically, those articles are not shown in isolated fashion. You have reader comments, feedback, the buttons, you know, that tells you what the other users do, tweets, retweets, number of tweets, and so on. I have circle here in red, the number of Facebook posts, for example, and comments that people have uh, put on this. But how is this impacting people's attitude towards scientific topics? This is really a question where social science hasn't thought too much about it. And I'm gonna conclude by telling you just a few words about this type of research. Online conversations are not neutral. And what I mean by that, that it can produce, for example, uncertainty. So you can have one of your studies, let's say on food uh, uh, safety, that's, you know, uh, uh, shown uh, and uh, summarized and uh, analyzed in a science column, and then a lot of comments that come afterwards. These comments can say, well, I'm not really sure what this is all about. This comment can also show emotions, and we're scared by this stuff. 
or people disagreeing and really being opposed to each other in the comments and or being really rude, right? And this is something that we know in the online environment, name calling comes up all the time. And I'm gonna just uh, show you uh, really briefly some result related to some research we've done called the nasty effect that look at the effect of that name calling when people are rude online. What does it do to potential attitudes towards science? So what we did is like we have an article that look at nanotoxicity, balance, look at the pro and con, what do we know, what don't we know? Should we go forward, what do we do? Very, uh, you know, balanced, normal, you know, uh, article written by a science writer that works with us. And what we did here, do you, you see on the, on, the, uh, on the right, we use a random sample of the American population and we created two groups here. One group actually saw rude blog comments, and the other group saw civil blog comments. And again, only the tone changed. So let's say one comment would say, I'm like really making it simpler here, but one comment would say, nanotechnology can really help us. And in the other group, the comment would say, nanotechnology could really help us, you idiot. So just the tone. The, the, the obviously, you know, uh, we can, we need to make sure we control all the potential effects, right? So what did we see? Well, we saw, that's what we call the nasty effect, that those rude comments polarized the readers. Remember, they saw the same story. The only thing that changed was the tone. Well, people who read the uncivil comments, only different with tones, end up walking from the study with a polarized understanding, they weigh way more against the technology than those that saw exactly the same story, but just with neutral comments. And ironically, and this is actually interesting, uh, our study came a, 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 a case in point. So it was first you know, reported in the journal Sentinel, uh, coming from Milwaukee, the, the biggest circulation in, in, uh, in Wisconsin, in the print version, and then went on the, uh, uh, you know, the online version. Online comments hurt science understanding study fine, but here we have comments. And these comments actually, I have to say, and also recommend on Facebook, were not always very nice to us. I'm used to it now, you know, with Twitter and I get a lot of, of nasty comments. And here, for example, and one, uh, uh, you know, told us that we were reptilian overlords, uh, and et cetera, and et cetera. A lot of very, uh, you know, like uh, 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 comments that were, rude to us, and so this actually was interesting to us because it ended up being uh, 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 talked about in uh, the, the serious version of The Onion. Do you know The Onion? For the international audience here, The Onion is a satire based uh, a newspaper that makes fun of things, and they have a, a serious branch uh, that's called the AV Club that actually monitors the media and that's some kind of analysis of what the media does. So this uh, 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 magazine said, online, awful online comments hurt understanding of news, reports local news site filled with awful online comments. So the idea is we're not quite sure how people understood our study after those online comments, but they make it an interesting story. And as a matter of fact, uh, our study became a, a, a case study in itself because it ended up being uh, uh, reported in uh, uh, the Proceeding of National Academies of Science uh, after coming up from a, 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 a colloquium, I think where Michael was and heard me, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, like a briefly, uh, you know, report on science in uh, ACS Nano, Nature, Science Friday, and then reached the popular media with, um, you know, different uh, media around the world, etc. to the point where it ended up with the New York Times uh, asking us to write an editorial with that title that I didn't choose, The Story Stinks, about these comments, and end up actually uh, leading popular science magazine shutting down their comments. The thing that was interesting to us, not that I had a particular stake in the popular science magazine closing the comments, is that we were the first study that I looked at the effect of comments on reporting about science. The first study, right? We need a lot of studies. We need to be able to know what we're doing. We need to learn to know if indeed, as we've shown, Twitter helps scientists. Yes, it does help scientists. 
what is the best way to actually engage with our readers? What's the best way for all of us, as you know, companies, uh, you know, public institution, uh, you know, private corporation and such, to make sure that actually the information is not distorted. It's extremely important to think about this. And this is why I would like to give you with this message. Remember that communication is complicated and we do need to think about it and have actually the means to do it well when we think about issues that are as important as the one that all of you here are discussing in this conference. Audiences are constantly finding contextualized information arise. And we do need to look at your practice to be able to inform social science and social science practice. We need to actually continue what the National Academy of Science is doing right now, training young scientists, make sure that this is taken seriously because the stakes are too high. The new generation of science has to understand the brave new world of science communication. Thank you very much. Please go to my lab, follow me on Twitter. And I'm looking forward to uh, your questions, comments, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and discussion on the pot topic or anything related to risk communication, actually. Okay, I'm going to hold back because I know there's a number of people that I was following on Twitter that probably have <laughs> tons of questions. So come up to the mic. Um, Who will be the first? There we go. Josh Anthony Campbell Soup Company. Wonderful, wonderful talk. One of the things that you said makes me kind of sad and just really wonder how we can address it. And that's specifically that knowledge only accounts for a small percent of attitudes towards scientific issues. And I feel that a lot of times people that get maybe the most attention are those communicating pseudoscience in line with popular opinion, right? So it becomes very reaffirming to the listener or the follower, the reader, right? It, but the basic premise or the basic whole point of science is to get toward truth and to communicate that even if it's not popular. So how can we reconcile that, you know, recognizing that probably the scientific community or, you know, kind of those that, ha you know, that are holding the knowledge, we probably don't have the same, uh, just by, by sheer numbers, the same number of people that can be influencing the media in a positive way? This is an excellent question, and this is, I think that's exactly why we need, I think we need training. Like what we, when I tell you about the younger generation of uh, scientists, I'm in the College of Agricultural Lab Sciences, right? And so we have a science, media, and society class at the, I would say people take it at the junior level that already introduces those ideas to life scientists. So it is not like, you know, like that there is something that's new. There's something that's called the knowledge deficit model, which is the idea that because of the deficit in knowledge, people are not reacting the way we want to certain things. And this is what the research has shown us that, that doesn't work. Just by increasing knowledge, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. So what you said is like, what can we do? Well, we can talk to people in a way that they're less likely to discard what we're telling them. And there's actually a metaphor that uh, the president, the former chancellor of UW-Madison told me, he was really good at, uh, at communicating about science. Uh, that metaphor is like, we have to find the common rug where we, rug where we stand together. Is there some shared value that you have with the group of people you're talking to? Is there something else that actually goes beyond that scientific topic you want to talk about. Who is, who is the spokesperson that's likely to be trusted that can communicate your science? Because uh, risk communication 101, trust is more important than knowledge. The trustworthiness of the messenger is more important than the content itself. If I tell you something, right now you're listening to me because you're a captive audience and because I had a wonderful introduction, so you think I know what I'm talking about, I have an established authority. If you meet me, you know, like at the bus stop, another day, you're like, what is she talking about? You know, the context of the communication, the trustfulness of the communicator, the type of framing that's used, the values 
that are integrated to the communication. All these are things that are important to, to, to think about, and it's important to think about uh, social science that has shown us a certain thing. By the way, if you are any interested in any of these things that we're talking about, I'd be really happy to send you publications to actually further uh, this, uh, this discussion. I just want to build on the, the last question um, with my favorite quote about the internet, and it's a paraphrase, and I don't even remember who, where I first heard it. But the quote is, we now all, because we have a gizmo in our pocket, we now all have access to the entirety of human knowledge in our pocket, and we use it for arguing with strangers and looking at cat photos. And my question is, my perception of science online in these discussions is that we're arguing with strangers. And what, what, I, you know, what I need, what's missing, is how do we move beyond that? How do we actually develop a community? How do we communicate effectively with people without just falling into this trap of getting involved in never-ending, nasty online debates that really aren't advancing the, the dialogue substantially? That's an excellent point, because what we want is not shut down comments and shut down discussion but promote meaningful public deliberation, right? So particularly if we think in terms of what I was telling you when I started with, you know, that science that goes so fast, we don't want to do that. So uh, there is uh, different things that can be done. First of all, I mean, I'm an optimist in nature, so I do think you can find intelligent people everywhere, right? There's a random, uh, you know, the normal uh, curve of uh, intelligence is the same among academics, among everything, right? So one idea would be to actually find somebody intelligent that's in the other side. And you can follow these people on Twitter. I have a lot of Twitter followers, or not a lot, I don't have a huge following, but I have some Twitter followers that actually, uh, you know, disagree with me with some ideas. But then we exchange articles. We actually discuss things in a way that's, uh, that's uh, meaningful. So to some extent is identifying those key players that will be the bridge. Remember when I was telling you about those social networks that be connected by those nodes? We call them the weak ties. Those are the weak ties because they're not in the central. They may not have one million followers, these people, but they connect different networks. And they are the spokesperson that maybe will be listened by the nasty group. And this is where all the research on social networking, influential as such, can be extremely interesting. It's also that idea when I was telling you about uh, you know, trust, is that we can find a way sometimes to portray our ideas in an environment that's not used to hear them. The first time I, pu I tried to publish an article on uh, climate change communication, you know, I was actually in a social science journal, they told me, why don't you stick to scientific journal? Who cares about this? That was a long time ago. But then nanotechnology, for example, we had the same reaction in social science journal. Well, the first time I tried to publish a social science article in science magazine, they told me, what are you talking about? So those stereotypes, those, those different diversions, you know, exist also in between disciplines. So what did we do? We actually were very determined and having our research published, for example, in the Journal of Nanotechnology Research. For scientists that are not used to our ideas, but actually would potentially, you know, be open to them, seeing them in an environment where they're likely to trust it. If I'm talking about social science is a, a natural science magazine, it's more likely that those natural scientists will trust what I say. You see the metaphor? So this is the kind of things that we can do. And again, we, this could be the topic of three other talks. But those are excellent questions, and these are the questions you should be asking yourself. And that's why I think it's important to establish those dialogues right now as we think about the way to move forward. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your presentation. My name is John O'Brien. Um, my fellow countryman, George Bernard Shaw, observed that the pr trouble with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. That is, I'm sorry? The illusion that it has taken place, communication that is. Yep. Would, would, would Shaw regard micro, microblogging as communication? 
in the true micro sense blogging? of the word. Yeah. So microblogging is Twitter, basically. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you can say everything is uh, communication or nothing is communication, indeed, and this could be another talk. Yeah. If based on philosophy and you know, like uh, uh, epistemology and etc. And uh, fascinating topic, I agree. Well, I would actually argue that uh, communication is the sum of the parts would be better than if you just do one thing. So I would argue that actually have an extensive article promoting anything, or explaining anything, if it's not you know uh, done in conjunction with Twitter with blogging, with face-to-face uh, -face where I'm doing mm -hmm. that, yeah. is likely to fail. Because what happened with the microblogging is like you're reaching a certain type of audiences mm -hmm. that you may not be reaching with the other medium. So what you want to do is triangulate, therefore, to make sure that you will be more likely to be heard, reinforced, mm -hmm. etc. But indeed, I agree with you, 140 characters, you cannot do much. Yeah. However, you can link. You can link to things. You can actually have PDF. And I've been, you know, by, I have some, uh, 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 a lot of colleagues now, they do most of their news watching through Twitter. They have the people that they trust to be the gatekeeper to find the things that they think is going to be interesting, and they, they, they find it on Twitter. But this is a good point. I have a second more straightforward question. Um, your observation that the more a scientist tweets, the more they're cited, is extremely interesting. You said this is good for science. Well, how is it good for science? That's I see question. that you, you you like to have deep discussions. This is great. Um, well, it depends what you mean. Deep, good for science. I was saying very, you know, pragmatically. If you're a director of a lab, and you'd like to have the research of your lab cited. And therefore, if you define good for science in a very simple term such as this one, then yes. But indeed, do we want to have bad research cited? That's another question. I could actually argue something else to convince you with another topic. That the paper that we also are working on, uh, we use an intelligent algorithm to map the discussions that go on in that blog sphere, et cetera, you know, basically the census of the discussion, sentiment analysis. So what we've done is that we followed, how, do you remember a paper that was based, that was a cold in controversy called the arsenic bacteria? Remember that? And then it was, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was a press release, and then they said, you know, this is like a, uh, uh, not really a good study. Na, 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 na. Well, it was published in Science. After publication in Science, there was an extensive discussion that went on in the blog sphere by fellow scientists that actually pointed to different uh, flaws in the methodology, which actually ended the paper, like another paper contradicting being published, etc. Therefore, the peer review system was enhanced because of that, because microblogging, because blogs here. I think, I say this is good for science. I mean, we've all been reviewers, right? I mean, we do our best, but error is human. If we can have more eyes that look at what we're doing and look at, it's gonna be more and more the case, open source journals that actually add different type of like open forum for their members to promote discussions. I think this is good for science. So different facets, and we could argue about good or bad, but certainly changing science. By the way, if you're interested in this, I'm teaching a grad seminar called Science and Social Media in the Spring. Hashtag LSE 875. My, my students are going to be tweeting about it. Follow it. React to it. I'll be happy to see what's going on. Hashtag LSE 875. It's a grad seminar in science and social media. Yes. Loved your presentation. Kimberly okay. Reed, International Food Information Council. Um, one point I just want to make sure everyone knows, um, we're going to have the world's largest, most historical gathering on food and conversation on food that's going to be lasting for six months from May to October this year. It's called Expo Milano. 144 countries will be building pavilions. It's underway. 
And uh, an estimated 1 billion people will be engaged online. 20 to 30 million will be walking through that expo uh, over six months. Which so expo? It's called Expo Milano, the World's Fair. Oh, it's been rebranded. Yes, I heard and about it. And this one is important because yeah. it's a themed World's Fair. And yeah. the, the theme is Feeding the Planet, Energy for Life. Yeah. So again, it'll be the world's largest, most historical gathering on food and conversation. So I hope we're all talking about what's important to us as everyone else definitely will be. Um, my question is, you are just tremendous. Tell us where we need to be thinking uh, two years, three years, four years, and five years out because there were some communication tools that were popular five years ago that uh, got nowhere. And we need to be smart and stealth about this as we look to the future. So, so what's on your radar for the next few years? What, what, sorry? What, what communication tools besides Twitter, blogging, well, and all you know, that? Well, it's interesting that you say that because, uh, you know, Twitter may cease to exist in three years. Who knows? So uh, the, that's, the, that's the beauty to some extent. I like to do new things. So I guess I'm going to get stay busy. I have combined what I call controversial science to social media. So hopefully I get, uh, you know, busy for the rest of my career. Who knows? But uh, it's also a challenge because you do need to stay in touch with what's going on. And there's a lot of things going on. I have touched the tip of the iceberg with the big, you know, social media networks I have told, uh, talk, told to you about, you know, Facebook, Twitter. But I mean, look at the, just in the pure scientific environment, I think like the uh, clo close gated communities of research are extremely interesting. ResearchGate, for example. I mean, I don't know if you're part of ResearchGate, uh, or Mendeley is another one, where you can post your, your, um, your scientific papers, and, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, anybody that follows different topics, it's not a hashtag, but it's a kind of the same idea. They see what you publish. I mean, I do that. You know, it's actually interesting, because when you look at the impact factors, and we're talking about citations, there's different ways, you know, our metric, for example, has uh, uh, mentioned that maybe we should also look at the public reach of these kind of things. How, ma how often people download your paper, these kind of things. Where in ResearchGate, that's what people do. They exchange papers. They're not supposed to very often, but they're doing everywhere anyway. This is going to be interesting because as far as copyright and such, it opens a lot of different discussion. But all those communities are something we should pay attention to because these are going to be more and more, I think, of use for the, for the scientific community. As far as uh, uh, communication in itself, you know, it's interesting, but I think we're going to see a proliferation of different uh, type of tools that are going to be really targeted to different needs. So I think different communities are building their own type of, uh, of, of tools that can be, uh, you know, adapted to their, to their needs and know that, for example, in extension, you know, you have uh, different tools that have been uh, put together just to be more adapted to the type of work. So, I cannot tell you exactly what's going, going to happen, but certainly a lot of things are going to happen. One more question. One more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Anytime, anytime. And you'll be here this evening, right? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Broussard. Uh, you said that the messenger is more important than the message. So through communication tactics, how do you become a trusted messenger? Or how do you go from being trusted to untrusted? Wow, so famous quote, trust is really hard to build, but once destroyed, it's really hard to rebuild, right? So what you have to do, and I think com private companies know that very well, it's a question of brand equity. You wanna actually maintain the trust of your, of your customers, customers broadly construed from the public uh, institution side uh, or not. So like the people that actually are looking for that information. Trust is an, if you're interested in the topic of trust, by the way, uh, the National Academies of Science is putting together a workshop, I think it's gonna take place in uh, uh, March, uh, and I can send information to Michael maybe, to send to the members, where they're gonna look at that uh, aspect of trust and scientific communication, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you can follow them with on Twitter, on their blogs, and anything. Trust is a complicated uh, uh, concept because it means different things in different contexts. So research shows, for example, that trust, when it applies to government agencies, people have a trust in government agency mainly when these agencies can show a sense of commitment and a, a, a sense of, uh, uh, of honesty. 
I mean, it's easy to actually explain, though, is because basically people think that, the, you know, political groups, they do that just because they want to be reelected. But if you can show that you're committed and you have a strategy and consistently you do that, if you are in that side of the stakeholder group, this is easier to actually induce trust. For businesses, actually, what we know also in uh, risk communication, public relations research, is more showing concern and care. For a business point of view, this is where trust comes about. And the famous example is Johnson & Johnson that were, you know, like they're the public relation, you know, uh, uh, staple when they did with the Tylenol recall in the 80s, I thought, where they actually recall, they took out all uh, uh, Tylenol uh, products uh, because there was some arsenic that was found in some bottles. They didn't know where, in which part of the chain this happened, but they took the gamble to actually really take everything out in order to make sure that they could tell to their customer, we care. Look at that, we care enough. As a matter of fact, it was a good uh, thing that they did because actually their brand really gained a lot of momentum because of that. But where they, they were the first that actually gave a case study that showed that trust was related to concern and care. From an activist point of view, smaller nonprofit groups, so I said the government, its commitment uh, uh, for, for uh, businesses is concern and care. And from activist groups, smaller group, the main dimension of trust is related to uh, knowledge and expertise. If you actually can show that you know a lot and you're an expert. So when we talk about trust, we need to be careful. Because depending on the context in which this uh, trust plays, or what you're talking about, where you're coming from, which they call you, you represent, you need to actually have different strategies to make sure that people uh, trust whatever you have to say. But uh, this is important indeed to think about. Okay. A round of applause for Dr. Broussard.